Well, good morning. Welcome to my studio here in uh, fabulous Las Vegas. This lecture is on taxation. It's appropriate for SIE, Series 6, uh, Series 7, Series 65, and it will be put into those playlists. It will be a fulfillment of a lecture request. We do fill, uh, fulfill lecture requests on the YouTube channel. I think we've done types of customer accounts was a lecture request. Uh, uh, mnemonics, memory aids, and test taking tricks was a lecture request. Um, underwriting municipal bonds uh, and the municipal spread, you know, the additional takedown, that selling group, that was, uh, again, a lecture request. Uh, they've proven to be popular. In this case, I'm more than happy to do this uh, lecture and fill that request because it's a uh, participant uh, on the channel, uh, very loyal and uh, disciplined in terms of going through the lectures. And actually, he's got, uh, got a call of my brain farts and said, hey, Dean, I think you missed this one. And I appreciate him uh, acting as not only doing the work he needs to do to pass his exam, which I'm sure he'll do based on his execution of his study plan, but also, you know, uh, let me know if he finds a little uh, brain fart in one of these uh, lectures. He's also a participant in our little community we have on the Reddit uh, called R Series 7. So we have a little subreddit community. I know you're surprised, R Series 7. I guess you can figure out how we how we came up with that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, you know, Oliver Window Holmes uh, said, taxes are the price you pay for civilization. And the more civilization you want, the more taxes you're going to need to pay, right? You know, the way I think of taxation is I have three baskets that I report on. My paycheck income, that's me working for money, sometimes referred to as uh, earned income. We'll talk about that and we'll talk about the test questions associated with that. You know, when this lecture request came in, I was telling the person who requested it that I usually talk about taxation as I talk about the various investments. So, you know, part of the challenge is to figure out how to, you know, come up with a flow, come up with the slides and do that. I mean. I wish we were not in the pandemic and I could, uh, like my friend Brian Lee, just grab my dry erase board and that's uh, what we used to do prior to February of last year. But anyways, uh, that's a little more difficult to do and have the camera pinned to me and a dry erase board. Maybe we'll try that someday. I do have a beautiful uh, full class that was fit, uh, professionally videographed and maybe I'll figure out how to get that up on the, on the web at some point. Anyways, um, and I don't know, I said, you know, and then all the content is proprietary. So it's not like I'm reading somebody else's book or I'm using somebody else's slides or I'm just going to, you know, you know, riff on it. I want to have kind of a, a, a flow to the thing. And so coming up with some kind of flow is sometimes a challenge. But here's the flow that I've decided for this lecture. We're going to talk about paycheck income, you working for money. We're going to talk about portfolio, your money working for you. That's the biggest thing we're concerned with on the test. You know, I joke, what an emotional turn on it is when we can call our clients and say, listen, you now have enough money working for you that you don't need to work for your money any longer. We have arrived at our financial destination. And boy, that's a great thing to be able to tell somebody, right? Say, listen, you don't want to go to work tomorrow. Instead of calling in sick, you can call in rich. You can almost, I got an eye problem. They say, what's wrong with your eyes? You say, I can't see coming to work. Uh, my broker called me, my financial professional, my investment advisor rep, and said, we're, we're good to go. And then passive, that's the smaller basket, as you see here. That's your partnership stuff. And we'll talk about that. All right, so let's get started. Your paycheck, you working for money. So one thing we want to try and do is reduce your paycheck or taxable income. And one way you can do that is by funding a qualified retirement plan. Qualified means you've met the qualifications of the IRS and the Department of Labor to be using uh, pre-tax money to fund it. Now I wouldn't get hung up on the number. I just want to show you what this looks like. So here, let me get my whoop, let me get my annotation tool going. Now, let's try yellow. I think that might work. And let's say that I made um, 80 grand here. You know, and then I'm gonna put uh, 19.5. Uh, well, let's see, I want yellow. I think yellow is going to stand out a little better. And I'm going to put uh, 19.5 into my 401k. That's the max, not testable. I'm just showing you how this works. So I'll tell you if a number is something that you need to worry about. And as I always tell people, my arithmetic is terrible. So I'm going to get out my calculator here, 80 grand. 
That was my taxable income before I put 19.5 into the 401k pre-tax. And now we minus the 19.5 that went in the 401k and I've reduced my uh, taxable income to 60,500. Uh, so that's kind of cool, right? That's one way we want to, in terms of taxation, think about it is that we can fund a qualified plan as investment professional. Uh, we certainly want to do that. Let's try it again. So we got 80 grand here. And assuming you, uh, there's a phase in of deductibility on IRA, on a IRA. So let's assume that uh, on your IRA, let's just go back here. And let's assume that your uh, deductibility, you, de you know, you can deduct the whole thing as you can see here, six grand. So we do it again. We take your taxable income, 80 grand, assuming you can deduct the IRA. You know, there's a phase in of deductibility, depending on you know uh, whether you have a qualified plan in place or access to one through your spouse or employer. We won't worry about that right now. But again, I've reduced the uh, paycheck income, my taxable income, by funding the IRA to 74 grand. So you know that's what we mean by pre-tax or a qualified plan. You can reduce your your paycheck income of that basket that you're reporting on. Uh, a TSA, tax sheltered annuity, tax sheltered annuity. Uh, you know, maybe, I don't know if I should qualify, uh, you know, I mean, that's the point, I guess I should. A TQ means, you know, test question or not exactly, but somewhere around there. So this is a taxation lecture requested, but I would want you to know, I would want you to know that it is very testable, know who qualifies for a TSA. Be, care be careful, make sure on the test you can distinguish between a TSA and a TDA, those are different things. A, tra a tax deferred annuity is different than a tax sheltered annuity. The biggest thing, right, is that this is after tax and this is pre-tax, this 501C or 403B. And again, same thing, again, we go back. And if you are an employee of a nonprofit, or an employee of a, a 403B educational institution, be careful. The trick is not just teachers or doctors, right? The nurses that work at the nonprofit hospital or the, um, uh, the janitor or nurse that works at the school, they get it too, they get it too. All right, so let's just go back again. And let's say that I put, uh, you know, uh, made $60,000 and I qualify for TSA and maybe I put $8,000 into that. And again, I've reduced my uh, paycheck income, my taxable income here to uh, $52,000. Now, remember, that means everything that's in that uh, TSA, you know, maybe I should have a separate little loop here where we say, you know, whoop, we say, you know, this money that we're taking out of our pre um, thing pre-tax is going into a separate basket for retirement. You know, and it'd be a sin to take a loss in the retirement plan because that money is typically growing tax deferred, right? So maybe we make a little bucket over here for that retirement money. The point is that all that money coming out of there is gonna be taxable, right? Uh, I would know that this money that you put into your 401k or your individual retirement account or your tax sheltered annuity, you could choose to draw down at 59 and a half, very testable. You must draw down at 72. You know, the IRS wants to make sure that at some point they get paid, they get some taxes from you. And then, as we said, very important, you have a zero cost base in this bucket over here, right? You've never paid taxes of any of that money that we took from your paycheck to put into this retirement wrapper. So everything coming out of there is taxable. So, you know, if they say, for example, you put, uh, put uh, $22,000 in here, pre-tax, and now it's grown to $100,000, and uh, you get that $100,000 out, the entire $100,000 you owe taxes at ordinary income tax rates. You know, the theory here is that you're going to be in a lower tax bracket when you're older and withdraw this money. I, I found in my practice that not to be the case. That, you know, as people accumulate things and make investments along the way, that's a lot of them end up in a higher tax bracket. But that's the theory anyways. Now, the other thing you can do, again, to offset your paycheck income is, you know, we can take our gains and our losses and we net them all out. So let's just go get back again. We got 80 grand here. 
And when I net all my gains and losses from my portfolio, I have an overall loss of, you know, uh, let's say net all my gains and losses, and I have a loss of uh, $12,000, just making that up. But, well, I make up a better number. I have a, a net loss. I sell all my stocks, I realize all the losses, it's 80 grand. Now, what I'd like to do is say, I made 80 grand in paycheck income and I lost 80 grand in my portfolio, so I, I owe no taxes this year. No. I mean, that's the whole point of what I'm about to discuss with you is the max you can take from over here to over there to reduce that is $3,000. So what I'm going to be able to do here is take from my portfolio losses 3000 and say I made 77000 By the way, that's the whole point of the rule is to prevent you from zeroing out your paycheck income, right? So I can only take three. Now, if I have money, you know, losses, maybe I got, you know, uh, uh, what I say, $80,000 loss. So I use three of it. And so now I carry the $77,000 for it. So I had $80,000 loss in my portfolio basket, my money working for me. I took three over here and then I can carry forward the 77,000 into the next year, whatever that next year happens to be. All right, so we've talked about this side. Uh, what else can you do with your paycheck income? You're working for money. You know, <laughs> I had a friend like Tim, he said, Dean, I'd like to talk to you about investments. I said, well, Tim, how much money do you have left over after paying your bills? And he said, zero. And I said, well, then there's nothing to discuss. I mean, what you need is a career counselor. You need to be able to make more money than you're spending so we can redeploy some of that into making some investments. At that point, there'd be something to discuss. He said, well, Dean, that's pretty rude. I said, well, I'm just, you know, telling you that you're kind of capped out at what you're doing here. I mean, you know, this is what this thing kind of pays and, you know, you need maybe a new career, right? If, because, you know, I know what celebrity bartenders can make, but this is kind of where your max kind of number seems to look like. Uh, Senator Roth is no longer around to protect the Roth IRA. If you're a senator and we name it after you, right, you come up with the idea, we name it after you. And so Senator Roth is the guy who came up with this idea where you could use after-tax money after tax money. So remember, I had that $80,000 in paycheck income. Let's just assume I wasn't able to reduce it at all. And that's my 80 grand that's taxable as, as ordinary income, as paycheck income, me my uh, working for my money, uh, 80 grand. You know, the predecessor company to a capitalist company called Dearborn. <laughs> they were they, you know, teasing me a little bit. I was part of the senior management team and they said, Dean, you drive us nuts. You always want more money for less work. I say, absolutely. I hope to be doing no work for a lot of money someday. <laughs> right? so, <laughs> the idea that I'm going to be doing no work and still be having money coming in is the idea of this investments, right? So one thing I can do is take part of my money after tax and fund a Roth IRA. Very testable. I have no required minimum distribution on the Roth. You know, the largest Roth IRA I'm aware of is uh, Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney funded his uh, Roth IRA with hundred million dollars after tax, he got when he took a distribution from Bain Capital. And boy, he's looking good as he ages. He's not gonna get any nasty note. I don't know what he is, 76, 77. Uh, Mitt is not gonna get any nasty letters saying that he has to take any kind of a required minimum distribution uh, from his Roth IRA. And when he does take withdrawals, I saw him, he said he asked his wife for, if they could take a distribution to fund his uh, campaign, his presidential campaign, his Senate campaign. And uh, he said he, they agreed to a budget about what they're going to take out of the Roth IRA as a distribution, but it's a uh, tax free. So that's really cool. Now, assuming you've maxed out all your other things, you've maxed out all your other kind of things, your 401k, your you know, IRA, whatever the case may be, you might want to consider taking some after tax money, paycheck money, and buying a variable annuity, also known as a tax deferred annuity. Now, you're funding that after tax. So you are going to have a cost base in that. And then when you're 59 and a half, you're hoping that the money you put into the separate account, the mutual fund, this is not a lecture on mutual funds or variable annuities, it's a lecture on taxation, uh, that you'd like to take the money out. So I uh, used, uh, I think in the last class, I used uh, the uh, tennis player, Naomi, right? Naomi's what, 21 years old? I say, Naomi, listen, you can't possibly spend all the money you're winning in these tennis tournaments. Why don't you give me 5 million after tax to go buy you a variable annuity? We'll put that $5 million into a separate account, a mutual fund, where it will grow tax deferred. Again, that's why we sometimes refer to that as a non-qualified retirement plan, because the money is growing tax deferred. 
And let's say uh, she's, let's say she's 21. Let me get my calculator again. I'm terrible at arithmetic. Uh, minus 22. So 37 and a half years from now. Woo. We're hoping that that thing has grown. Let's say it's grown to just to keep my math simple, hopefully more than this, but to keep my math simple, let's say it's 20 million. So she put uh, 5 million into this thing. And now it's grown to $20 million. And she says, well, let me clean up my slide here. So she gave us 5 million. I'll put VA variable annuity grows to 20 million. I think we've agreed that uh, Naomi was 21. Now she's 59 and a half. And she says, hey, Dean, uh, I want to do a random withdrawal. So in terms of, uh, you know, turning into an income stream, she says, send me uh, some money. I said, how much do you want? She says, Dean, send me the 5 million I originally put in there that I paid taxes on. I say, no can do. You know, whenever you're struggling on your exam about what the right answer is in tax questions, it's always what yields the most to the U.S. Treasury. Whatever yields the most to the U.S. Treasury, that is usually the right answer. So if I send her that money, uh, five million, it's gonna be five of the 15 that she's never paid taxes on. That's gonna be taxed at ordinary income tax rates. She says, well, Dean, ordinary income tax rates on $5 million, man, if I had put that in an index uh, mutual fund or something like that, it would have grown. And maybe I would have qualified for a long-term capital gain. I go, well, yeah. That's true. Right. You shouldn't have told me that. Yeah, I should have told you that. Right. So when you start this thing, uh, setting this thing up, you should understand the customer should understand that, you know, when they go to get this money out, it's going to be taxed at ordinary income tax rates. Uh, the cost base is the cost of the investment. In my example with her, it's uh, $5 million. I just made that up. Another thing I could recommend to you, depending on your tax bracket, very important, very important is what is your tax bracket? You know, uh, if you're making a lot of money, the more blessed you are, the higher your tax bracket. And the higher your tax bracket, the more a municipal is going to make sense. Because municipal bonds, test question, are federally tax exempt and may, depending on suitability, where you live and what kind of bond you're going to buy, may be exempt on the state level. And if you perhaps live in a city like Philadelphia, perhaps, or New York City, where they have a city income tax, may, based on suitability, be triple exempt. Now, all we can say without knowing where you live and what kind of bonds you're going to buy is that they're federally tax exempt. But I might suggest to you to buy some municipal bonds. You know, I have, um, uh, I don't know if you remember when John Kerry ran for office, his wife, Teresa Hines, released her tax return and she was collecting $24 million a year in tax-free interest. Woo! You know, she's got some muni bonds. She's got lots of them, right? Now, I doubt she's got one block of muni bonds that pays her $12 million on January 1 and $12 million on July 1st. If I were her broker, I'd say, hey, uh, Teresa, why don't we get you some J&J &J bonds, some F&A bonds, M&S, A&O, M&N, J&D. So every month you have, what, uh, 24 divided by 12, 2 million hitting your brokerage account. I might even suggest that we get all those dated dates. That's what that's called. Maybe some J&Js, J&J &J 15s, F&A 15s. M&S, M&S 15, so every two weeks, you would have a million dollars hitting your brokerage account. Now, I doubt that Teresa is going to sell her bonds. You know, most people buy muni bonds, just hold them to maturity. But uh, what I'm trying to tell you here is that the only component of a muni bond that would be tax-free is the, uh, the coupon. If you buy low and sell high, it's just like any other investment, you're going to owe capital gains on it. And then you could buy some other investment vehicles that we'll be discussing, stocks, bonds, you know, partnerships, uh, other investments you can buy after tax. The idea is to take this paycheck money, right? And get it going to work for you over here, right? Take some of it over here, redeploy it. And so that you get that money working for you. We'll talk about these other various investment vehicles. By the way, that's 91 questions if you're on a series seven. And, you know, SIE, that's very important, very important. Uh, <laughs> I know founder of a, a private equity firm and he was telling me that his barbell strategy, not barbells as we think about it on 65, is in his own personal life, he says he takes uh, all his money and only does two things in his portfolio, buy municipal bonds and invest it in his own private equity funds, which I thought, well, hey, that's worked for him, right? All right, so let's talk now a little bit about the portfolio, your money working for you. 
And we're going to be talking about your portfolio, your money working for you and the tax consequences of that. And I kind of like this little slide I picked out for us. It kind of showing you your money never sleeps, right? You know, you can only work so many hours for your money before, you know, the day is over, but not so your money. Your money can uh, keep be out there working uh, 24 seven for you. Realized gains or losses. So very important concept, watching your securities go up or down is not taxable. If you just punch into your brokerage account and you're looking at your securities, that's not taxable. I joke sitting in your house and watching the homes in the neighborhood, including yours go up is not taxable. What's taxable if you then decide to sell the investment, you know, sell the house or in our case, sell the investment vehicle. Now, very important to know short-term versus long-term. Now, short-term, if you buy and sell in 12 months or less, it's gonna be taxed at ordinary income tax rates. And for most people, that's a, hard, a higher number. You know, um, Deborah's a friend of mine and Deborah and I were considering buying this investment, same investment. She opened her laptop, hit the button, poof, she bought it. She goes, Dean, what's wrong with you, man? And I said, well, I gotta decide where I'm gonna put it. Am I gonna put it in my personal account? I'm gonna put it in my retirement account. I said, Deborah, to be honest with you, I may not be around for 12 months with this investment. For the right price, I'm out of here. And I don't want to have to pay short-term capital gains rate. No, so she put it in her personal account and I put it in my retirement account. We both got lucky. We made some money. And then I went neener, neener, neener. I know how blessed you are, Deborah. You're in a very high tax bracket. And I know how much of that you're going to have to give back in terms of taxes. And then I, she goes, Dean, but I have the money now. You know, your money is in your retirement plan. You know, you can't get it unless you take a distribution or get to 59 and a half or, oh man, damn you. <laughs> so it's an important consideration. You know, if I've held an investment for 11 months and 29 days, maybe I want to hang out another, you know, three days or so to get over that one year line, right? Uh, all option tradings offsets. So let's get a thing here. The, this language is actually more testable than the, the tax things. You know, I could actually call this lecture the same thing I called the, the margin lecture. Don't overdose. Don't overdose on taxation. We're not supposed to be tax people. If a client asks me for tax advice, they say, listen, I don't render tax advice. I'm not your numbers guy. I'm your ideas guy. Now, I have to have enough of a general understanding of how taxes impact investments because I don't want his you know, tax professional, his CPA, whoever, to say, boy, your broker's clueless. You know, you need a new broker, right? But you know, what we mean by offsetting transactions, I'm either doing, let me get a different color here. I'm either doing a closing sale or, you know, sales, because I could have more than one contract, or I'm doing a closing purchase. That's what we mean by offset. Again, this isn't an options lecture, but, you know, a closing sale is used to eliminate or reduce a, a long position. You know, I buy the caller put low, I sell the caller put high, I owe taxes on that, so, or loss, right? I buy it high and sell it low, you know, whatever the case may be. Closing purchase is what I use to offset or eliminate or reduce a short position. And that's pretty simple. We're just going to net the gain or loss and it's going to be taxable. In all options trading, including the option expire, as we said in our previous lecture, let's put that up here. You know, uh, three things can happen with an option contract. It can be traded, it can be exercised, or it can expire. So if the thing is traded or it expires, that's going to be short term. Now, there's one exception to that. And the one exception to that is a LEAP. You know, they like to test you on a LEAP. You don't need to know that LEAP stands for Long-Term Equity Appreciation Potential Security. Now, a LEAP is technically 39 months, in practice, 36 months, but it's more than a year. And so one way they can test you on a LEAP is to say, which of the following is the only option contract that may qualify for long-term capital gain? And you'd say, ah, well, the only contract that could possibly could I could hold for more than a year would be a leap, would be a leap. So, um, you know, the other thing that can happen, as we said, besides trading it is exercise. And we'll talk about exercise when we talk about the cost base that you may have in the stock. All right. So long term, we said is tax at long term capital gains. And that's usually a less of a number. And we said that you can only use three thousand dollars offset your paycheck income. We showed that to you. Here's just an example of this. Uh, I net, 
you know, this uh, person uh, who we're making the lecture for, uh, we explicated a, a question for him and it was very much a question like this. I think in that question, the guy had uh, $9,000 in a loss carry forward. He had made, I think, um, 15 grand netting, right? So he netted, this is the stocks he bought and he sold and on that he had made 15 grand. And then he, uh, the stocks they bought and sold, he uh, had a loss of 2000. So the net in the portfolio was 13, right? And then they uh, had a loss carry forward for nine, he owes taxes on four, very much a, a test scenario. And what he's being tested on is this idea about, you know, whatever, you can only use three and then you carry forward the rest of it. So here's an example or didn't do so well this year. I made 2000. Now the stocks I bought and sold in this year, 2020, I had $2,000 in losses and the stocks I bought and sold in 2020, uh, I had $15,000 in losses. So when we net those two numbers, that's a $13,000 loss. And so I can only take 3,000 of that against my paycheck income that we talked about. You know, I think we were talking about 80 and I took it to 77. So we lost 13, that's got 10 and that goes into 2021. That's available for me in 2021. And I would use that in that year. You know, if I can use all of it, perhaps, you know, sometimes that's something you consider, right? Um, you know, I had a, a client take a, what I thought for me was a large loss for everybody. It's a different number, but for me, I thought it was a large loss, loss. And I said, wow, I said, you know, you unsolicited. This was his idea, not my idea. And the loss was like 120 grand. And he said, yeah, that's all right. I can use that loss this year. I actually have a big game that I'm going to take and I'll use the loss. And I said, man, wow, I wish I lived in your world. That must be a wonderful world to, to live in, <laughs> right? So you might want to consider. Uh, the one that uh, I on that question, the best one I can recall of this was the taxable year where Rupert Murdoch sold uh, Fox to Disney. He received, a, you know, some Disney stock, which would not be taxable, but he also received a lot of cash. You know, receiving stock is not taxable, but uh, getting the cash certainly is. Anyways, uh, the, at that same year, he had lost $100 million in a stock fraud called Theranos. And, uh, you know, the person who went and solicited him for this private placement of a hundred million dollar investment, Reg D, by the way, that should have been red flag that uh, the issuer here is not using a broker dealer to raise the money. But anyways, he said, it's okay. He said, I'm gonna use the hundred million dollar uh, loss from Theranos this year to offset the gains I have this year from the cash I received from my Fox stock from uh, Disney. Woohoo. Okay, tax consequences of stock. So this is again, a lecture on taxation. Uh, hard to kind of, you know, come up with a flow or organize it. So this is the way I decided to organize it. The way we've organized the discussion is we've talked about three baskets. We're talking about your paycheck, baskets of income on your tax return, your paycheck income, your portfolio income, and your passive income, you know, or paycheck income, you working for money, W-2, 1099, you know, taxed at ordinary income rates, depending on your tax bracket. We've talked that now we're in this category called portfolio, your money working for you. We're talking about uh, profits and losses in your portfolio, buying and selling, whether those were short-term or long-term. And now we're gonna talk about the tax consequences of stock. If you receive a cash dividend that is taxed as ordinary income. So, you know, if you receive, oh, for example, uh, Andy Beal, owns a bank called Beal Bank. He owns 100% of the stock in Beal Bank. He is the sole shareholder. At Beal Bank paid a $300 million dividend. Andy Beal is gonna receive $300 million in dividends because he's the sole shareholder. He owes taxes on that $300 million. Now, I wouldn't worry about the test about qualified or unqualified, I just know it's taxable. Again, a lot of people overdose on taxation. And if on any of your FINRA or NAS exams, you tell me you missed the mark because of taxation, I'm going to say, I don't believe it. Now, if you tell me you missed the mark because you didn't know about various investment vehicles, well, then I'm going to say, well, gee, that's very possible. You know, a dividend of one corporation paid to another corporation is 50% uh, tax excludable. Pretty cool. You know, uh, Berkshire Hathaway owns a billion shares of Bank of America. A billion shares of Bank of America. Bank of America pays a 72 cent dividend. That's gonna be $720 million annually that Berkshire Hathaway is receiving from Bank of America. By the way, everybody who's a shareholder gets the 72 cents. It's just, if you have a billion shares, a little more exciting, right? Of that $720 million, only 360 million of it is taxable. 
And that's from one dividend paid to another. By the way, it used to be 70%. And they changed it. You know, so any of these tax things, boy, a big part of taxes is legislative risk. You know, what Congress giveth, Congress can taketh away, right? In fact, Congress right now is contemplating changing the tax code again. So, you know, I have to be able to say, well, I didn't do that to you. You know, Congress did that to you. Mr. Buffett used to be collecting Berkshire Hathaway, 720 million of that, uh, 720 million, 70% of it was tax excludable, now only 50%. You know, if the company pays a stock dividend or uh, does a stock split, you know, Tesla split five for one, Apple split four for one, you do not owe taxes on that. All you have to do is adjust your cost base. Now, you know, I'm wishing for you a dream draw. That's what I'm hoping for you. And if you're watching my lectures, you're going to get a dream draw because I always tell FINRA, hey, people watch the YouTube channel, Dean's YouTube channel. I'm kidding. But let's say I bought 100 shares at uh, 50. I just made that up. And so my cost base in that position, that investment, is uh, $5,000. And uh, whoop, let's say that the uh, issuer decides that they're gonna pay a 10% stock dividend. So you know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my 100 shares and I'm gonna times it by 10%. By the way, I get 10% more, but so does everybody else. And so now I'm gonna get 10 additional shares. Now, what I'd like to be able to do is sell my uh, new position because you know, after this, I'm going to have 110 shares. Right? I get the 100 I had plus the 10 from that. Uh, by the way, you see how I got the, the 10 additional shares? I just times the, whatever my position was by the stock dividend. Uh, times, or excuse me, now it's a plus because I did that already. So that now means I have 110 shares. And what I would like to do is uh, sell the 110 shares at uh, 50 and tell the IRS I don't have a gain, I don't have a gain or loss because I bought them at 50 and I sold them at 50. So you got a typo there in my thing, oh well. Anyways, uh, IRS says, no, 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 Dean. You, you spent $5,000 for this uh, position. Yeah, but uh, you know now you have more shares. You have to adjust your cost base. I'm gonna take 5,000, my original cost base. I'm gonna divide by my 110 shares and I'm terrible at arithmetic, so I'm going to use my calculator. 5,000 divided by 110 is 45, 45. So I have an adjusted cost base of 45, 45. If I sell for more than that, I've got a gain. I sell for less than that, I've got a loss. Let's just uh, label that. Listen, I hope you remember telling you this. You don't really need to do what I just did because you always end up with more shares at a lower cost, more shares at a lower cost. There's only going to be one choice that is more shares at a lower price, right? And then the holding period you have on the stock will determine whether it's short term or not. So if you're selling the stock position 12 months or sooner after you bought, bought it, that's short term. And if you sell the stock after 12 months after buying, it's long term. And again, that's something you would think, think about. I mean, the capital gains tax is a transaction-based tax, and the easy way not to pay it is not to transact. I'm practicing looking at my uh, camera every now and again, so <laughs> I'm not a YouTube social media guy, so I'm trying to get better at it. Uh, also, my agenda is how to learn how to splice and do studio work, and you know, I'm just barely at the point where I can create a slide deck, so a lot of improvement can be done for sure. But anyways, um, you always end up with more shares at a, a lower uh, cost base. And then remember, you get taxed when you actually sell that. Uh, tax consequences of bonds. So remember, we have diff different types of debt instruments. We have corporate bonds. If we have a convertible bond, the, the conversion is not taxable. So, you know, I buy a 10-year convertible bond. I'll just make one up again. Let me get my annotation tool out. And I have a, a convertible bond and the conversion uh, price is $40 a share. Now, one thing you remember you got to do is you can't use the conversion price. You need to know the ratio. And so the way we do that is we take par and we divide by the conversion uh, uh, price, which in this case is 40. 
now I'm back in business because I can figure out how many shares I'm going to get. And let's see, uh, divide by 40, that's 25 shares. And uh, so, you know, 10 years from now, they say, Dean, do you want your $1,000 back? Do you want 25 shares? Uh, so I'll take the 25 shares. That is not a taxable event. So when I convert, it's not taxable. What will be taxable is when I sell those shares for whatever my cost base was, whether, you know, it was 40, because, you know, that's what I bought the bond at or parity, whatever the case may be. Interest received on corporate bonds is taxable at your ordinary income tax rates. We have municipal bonds. Now, we said municipal bonds, one of the reasons, main reason people buy them is because the interest they pay is federally tax exempt and maybe maybe state and local as well, right? And we said that, uh, you know, no matter where you live, you could always buy a territorial bond and that would be completely exempt, right? That would be Puerto Rico's what they like on the test. There is one suitability question again, based on your tax bracket. We're talking about tax station as it relates to investors and investments, both, you know, taxation as it relates to investors and investments. And before I sell you an industrial development revenue bond or an industrial development agency bond, I'd want to do a binary suitability question. Are you subject to the alternative minimum tax? Because if you are, this would be an unsuitable recommendation, right? Because, you know, these IDRs and IDBs serve a public, per, well, they are supporting primarily a private activity meaning the major beneficiary of this bond is the corporation that we're financing the facility for. And that being the case, the IRS says, well, we can tax on that. So, you know, we can, uh, you know, say, listen, well, you're not subject to the AMT. So maybe this is a good value for you because a lot of people shy away from them. If you are subject to the AMT, not a good recommendation. I'd be willing to bet you that Teresa has no industrial development rate and revenue bonds or any industrial development agencies in her portfolio. I'd be willing to bet you that founder of that private equity fund has none of these in his portfolio. So who knows, maybe it might be good value for somebody who's hunting around who isn't subject to the EMT. It's basically about 200 grand is where that starts to kick in. Uh, treasury bonds are exempt from state income taxes. But not federal, you know, the US government can and will tax you on that. And then uh, Jenny Mays, pay interest in principal monthly, and they are fully taxable. And as I mentioned, you know, uh, I usually talk about the tax consequences of the investment vehicles as we talk about those investment vehicles. You know, how does the tax consequences to the driver of that vehicle? But, you know, uh, I'm, you know, putting this lecture together and putting it in a separate category. Again, want to warn you, don't overdose on this thing. This is one of those, you know, uh, rabbit holes you could go down on your exam and it doesn't have a whole bunch of payoff. I mean, the stuff I'm telling you is there, is there. But you know, you make sure you're paying attention to how many performance opportunities, that's what I call test questions, are in that category because it may not be worth your time and energy. Uh, just had a, a test taker. We've been pretty, pretty, um, I told you the guy making this video for, I'm sure he's gonna pass. He's working hard, he's executing his uh, study plan, he's dedicated, he's disciplined, he's organized. But we've had some really good candidates of late and uh, I had another guy and I, I told him I can't really say yes to what he's asking. He said, Dean, I'm just looking at this section. There's only two points here. Is it worth my time and energy? I said, well, as a person who helps people through these exams, I can't really tell you not to read the book or not to, in fact, you should read the book cover to cover as close to one setting as possible. But, you know, I wouldn't feel comfortable telling you not to, to do that section or do those practice questions, even though I agreed with his premise. His premise was, Dean, by the time I read that and I do a hundred questions on it for a potential of two performance opportunities, I just think there's better use of my time. I said, well, you know, based on the conversations I've had with you, I would agree there's diminishing returns for you and that perhaps you should do that. Now, good news, he and the other student I'm telling you about are in, in what I call, by the way, he, he ran the table. We've had two or three people go undefeated past their ISIE, matriculated past the seven, matriculated past their 66. We're on quite a, quite a bit of a, a roll, so to speak. I'm uh, the person I'm making this lecture for. I'm sure he's going to go undefeated. I think he's going to go 3-0 and against NASA and FINRA, you know, SIE, FINRA, Seven FINRA, 65, uh, in this case, 66 NASA. Um, anyways, what I was going to say is, you know, don't overdose on this. Maybe I could call like my margin lecture. It's, it's not enough. Uh, I would tell you, depending on your vendor, you know, they go, they go way into this stuff. So just pay attention. 
Oh, let's clean, clean that. Tax consequences of mutual funds. Tax consequences of mutual funds. So one of the major disadvantages of a mutual fund is you give up control of your investments. Now, let's say I bought a thousand shares of Google at the IPO price of 85. $85,000. And, you know, now Google is $2,100. So now that position, I've watched it go from 85 grand, 2,100 times 1,000. It's now worth 2,100,000. And while my investment mind, remember watching it go from the IPO price of 85 to today's price of 2,100, that's not taxable. Watching it go up. And here it is this year, you know, now, and I'm looking at it and I'm going, Wow, it's been a good ride, been a good ride. I go, boy, if I sell that, I'm gonna have a, well, let's see, minus 85 grand, because remember that was my after-tax money. Uh, I'm gonna have a 2 million 15, wow, uh, let's see, make sure I can do that. 2 million $15,000 capital gain that I'm owed taxes on. And good news, it'll be at a long-term capital gains rate, but you know, I say, nah, I think I'll just avoid the tax by not doing the trade. Now, at the same time, Fidelity at the IPO price bought 10% of Google. Fidelity is a principal stockholder in Google and still is. Wow. They have a huge position in Google. Now, remember, if I'm in the Fidelity fund, I don't decide when to sell to Google. The portfolio manager decides when to sell Google. Uh, P.S. I know I have a habit of overcapitalizing. You know, people ask me what my major is. I always say literature because if I say English, they think I'm good at grammar and punctuation, which I'm terrible at. But anyways, um, I don't think I should have capitalized the P, but oh well. Remember, the point is, you don't decide. You now, uh, Fisher Investments loves to, you know, come on TV and say, hey, you know, you don't want no mutual fund. Why don't we create a custom portfolio for you, you know, where you can keep tax control of your investments. So that's one of the disadvantages of mutual fund. Now, when they decide to realize that gain, as you see here, it'll either be short-term or long-term, depending on the holding period of that fund. Now, the dividends, remember from your you know, other things, they're gonna pass through at least 90% of the net investment income. Most mutual funds do much better than that. You know, die 90 is the way we refer to that as kind of a mnemonic. And then when those dividends pass through to me, whether or not I reinvest them, I owe taxes on that. The IRS says, Dean, as far as we're concerned, you could add the money. That's the same as getting the money. That's called constructive receipt. So it doesn't matter whether I get the money or not. Now, the one exception to that is if I buy a muni bond mutual fund. You know, I always joke that uh, when I was, I started out as a retail broker, you know, there are haters out there. I, I had somebody accuse me of, Dean, you you are a silver spoon guy and you've only managed your own money. And I said, you have no idea who I am. I come from very, very, very humble beginnings. So anyways, I was a retail broker. I was pretty blessed through my career to end up as an institutional broker. But as a retail broker, I can't tell you, I would have never made it if I didn't have a go-to mutual fund. I used to use as my go-to the Franklin tax refunds, you know, because who doesn't want tax-free income, right? <laughs> I go, hey, doctor, hey, car dealer, you know. How about some tax-free income? Now, in the Franklin tax-free funds, right, the muni bonds that they own are paying tax-free interest coupon that's being passed through to me as a dividend. So the dividends I'm receiving from a muni bond mutual fund would be the exception to this, that I would actually not owe taxes on that. You know, I, uh, I was helping a guy with this 24 who's a Franklin guy like me, started out very humble beginnings, internal wholesaler at Franklin, worked his way up had a huge promotion. Now he's taking his serious 24. I said, listen, I'll do whatever I need to, to, to get you through uh, your 24. Cause we can't have you going down. I got nothing but love for, for Franklin. Anyways, uh, I asked him if Raphael Constance was still there and he, he said, you know, Raphael, I said, well, I, I know him casually. I mean, he was the man when I was, uh, you know, selling mutual funds to retail investors, he was the manager. I used to follow his interviews and send the clients. And one of my favorite ones is where he said that uh, he tries to be tax efficient he buys muni bonds, but he doesn't sell them. He just holds them to maturity to minimize the tax consequences. He goes, well, he retired a couple of years back. I go, oh, well, <laughs> oh, well. Uh, dollar cost averaging, dollar cost averaging in a mutual fund. 
Now, by the way, it would it would be the same if it was stock, but in dollar cost averaging, remember, there's three test questions, not in this tax lecture, but elsewhere about dollar cost averaging. The three test questions about dollar cost averaging is what makes it work? Fixed dollars invested regularly. What is the end result? You end up with a lower average cost than that of the underlying shares, and it doesn't guarantee a profit. So now uh, I've been dollar cost averaging for many years and I go to start redeeming shares. You know, how can I do that? I can do it any way I want. I can do it first in, first out, probably don't want to do it that way. I could do average costs. I could do share identification. The test question is, the IRS says, if you don't keep good records, they're going to impose upon me FIFO. As I said before, you always pick the whatever would yield the most to the US Treasury. And then when I redeem the fund, right? So I put uh, 20 grand to the fund. Uh, I watched the fund go from 20 grand to 100 grand. And now I redeem. Uh, I have an $80,000 taxable gain, right? So the NAV, X number of shares, whatever that was. And now this is what my account is worth. And again, that'll either be long term, you know, mutual funds are supposed to be for the long term. So the assumption here would be I have an $80,000. Uh, long-term uh, gain, I owe taxes on it. So that's redemption. Remember, no open-end fund, I'm not selling. I'm actually redeeming those fund shares. You know, one thing I, I should have probably put on the slide, and when we're done with the lecture, I'll probably open the slide deck. I always, you know, improve and edit the slide decks. Uh, you told you the candidate who recommended this, been very helpful in uh, some edits. And at some point, I'll circle back and redo lectures with improved slide decks and, you know, better better stuff. Right now, the game is not to let the perfect be the enemy of uh, the good and to get as much content up there as we possibly can for you. But one thing I, I just am going over this that just uh, hit my brain housing group is that, uh, you know, going from fund A to fund B within the fund family is also a taxable event. And I would know that. Again, we're assuming none of this is taking place in that little basket we created called retirement or qualified plans. We're assuming that, you know, this is outside of that little area. So. Uh, break even. So I, uh, you know, buy, let's just do an example. And by the way, you'd be doing yourself a great service if every time you hear the word cost base and it's an option to just do break even. We said, right, what can happen with an option contract? We said, T, it can be traded, it can exercise or it can expire. So now we're talking about what happens if we exercise the option contract. So if I uh, go uh, buy, Uh, one uh, Apple, uh, what is this? This is April, let's go out to uh, August. So I buy an Apple, a 120 call there. Let's just get our T fired up. Uh, listen, there's a lot of ways to do options. And so don't, you know, you don't have to do it the way Dean does it, but if you've been with me, and you've watched uh, the way I do it. I like to, you know, track money. And so now I exercise and my cost break, uh, cost base is 132. So whatever I sell the Apple for, that's gonna be my gain or loss. So you'd be doing yourself a great service if every time you hear an option exercise question about cost base, you do the break even. You'll be right 99 out of 100 times. There's an exception to that. You know, the exception is if you don't exercise, the another exception is, you know, when you marry a put to the stock position. But in general, you'll be right 99 out of 100 times. Uh, by the way, let me just do one more. So now I uh, sell one Apple August 120 put at, uh, let's say, eight. And again, then I uh, get exercised, right? Because here I don't decide, I, somebody else decides that. And so again, what I like to do is get my T fired up and say, okay, so I brought in eight for this and I got stuck the stock at 120. And so my uh, cost base in the Apple that I now own, right? Because I got Apple in my account, my cost base is 112. Cost base follows break even. All right, so if you just do that, you know, you'll get that right.
All right. So we have talked about thus far. Let's talk about where we're at, where we've been. Uh, we uh, started by saying that we're making uh, this lecture by request for one of our YouTube channel subscribers. We've talked about that. We've talked about this. And so the last thing we need to talk about is DPP's partnerships. And boy, whatever happens in that this basket over here stays in this basket. Nothing from here is going anywhere. So that's our last basket of income that uh, the way I think of it, right? The way Dean thinks of it is testable, but in terms of organizing it in your own brain, I say, okay, on my tax return, I'm gonna be concerned with my paycheck income, W-2, 1099, me working for money. We talked about the, how that relates to taking and passing your test. Then me, my money working for me, the bigger category, by the way, because that's what we as you know, investment professionals help you. We, you know, we don't help you too much with paycheck. We help you with portfolio right? The various investment vehicles, right? Stocks and bonds and, you know, options and mutual funds, all the stuff we have for people. And then the last investment vehicle, separate kind of a category in terms of how it relates is a passive. And I told you a lot of people call this, you know, the IRS calls this on earned income. I don't know why hazarding my capital is not earned, but some people call that earned. That's not really the test implications of it though. All right, so, you know, in terms of partnerships, there's a couple of concepts, you know, in terms of the distributions. You know, the distributions you're receiving from a partnership are gonna be on what's called a K-1. And we're gonna tell you in the K-1, your distribution and whether it's a distribution that you're gonna owe taxes on. In other words, the partnership is passing through to you passive income. Or whether the partnership is passing through to you passive losses. You know, one of the important concepts in a partnership, I probably should maybe put a slide like that there, is that, you know, we're not too concerned if the losses are not coming from the uh, cash flow. We're, you know, we're more concerned in a partnership where we have negative cash flow than a partnership in which we have positive cash flow and the losses is being caused by depreciation. Because, you know, depreciation is a non cash expense. So we're less concerned about that. You know, I, you know, say, Dean, I just got my K-1 from my partnership. I have this $10,000 loss. Can I take that against my paycheck income? Can you take, so what he's asking me, let's just get my highlighter out of here. I'm just making up the numbers, by the way. But, you know, he has a $10,000 uh, loss here. Can he take that over here and say, uh, I no longer have 80, I have a 70. New, 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 new. Whatever happens there stays there. So no can do. So whatever happens over that basket stays in that basket. All right, well, let me clean up the slide there. Now the test question here, you know, you're gonna get um, a handful. If you're SIE, a couple questions on uh, partnerships. Uh, series six is I'm putting this in your slide deck, your playlist, but you don't need to worry about this at all. I'm putting it in because the other things I talked about were testable. So it'll still be in your slide deck, but you know, you can disregard this slide. Uh, sevens, three, four, max five questions on partnerships as investment vehicles, not taxes. We're talking about taxes, but you know, investment vehicles. I have a whole separate lecture for you on that. And then 65s, two, three, maybe. So, you know, you're getting the flow through. You know, we say that partnerships give you a flow through of the passive income or the losses. What we mean by that is the partnership itself is not paying taxes. The tax consequences of the partnership are gonna be realized by the limited partners. And so it's either gonna pass, be passing through uh, profits or losses. Now, this is just a Dean thing, not Tesla, but I like to use a mnemonic to remind myself about pigs and pals, pigs and pals. You know, the suitability question uh, there was a huge commission for me. It was a $24,000 commission to the firm based on my payout. You know, I get a percentage of that, typically half. In this case, I get more than that because it's my firm. But anyways, uh, I was giving a the doctor the tour and, you know, going to sign him up for an asset allocation. And he said, well, Dean, it doesn't make any sense for me to invest in this thing. He said, I got so many partnerships right now, direct participation programs. It's ridiculous. It's embarrassing. And I have all these passive activity losses already that, you know, I'm stuck with. I really can't do anything with. By the way, the doctor 
isn't too concerned about those losses. Well, you know, because remember, most of those losses are from depreciation. You know, what he's really complaining about is that, you know, he's, you know, uh, got these shelters and the shelters aren't sheltering anything. You know? Anyways, I said, well, you know, doctor, I, I think you need to even make a bigger asset allocation because the recommendation I'm making to you distributes to you passive income. You know, it's going to be giving you passive income, cash distributions, and you can use it against his loss. You can collect, doctor, up to $100,000 in passive income here with no tax consequence. And so, you, you know, you should make an even bigger asset allocation. So, you know, you want to match a passive income generator with a passive uh, activity loss. So let's just put that there. You want to match your pigs with your pals. Now, let me give you the test question. Assuming you're taking a, an, uh, this is a 765 question more than it is a SIE question, but the one they love, the one they love is they like to say, your customer has a large amount of passive income, a customer, an investor, has a large amount of a passive income. Excuse me, yeah, passive income. Which DPP might be suitable? So based on this idea that I wanna match pigs with pals, I say, okay, well, I call my client. I say, hey, listen, you know, uh, we have these uh, have passive income right now, passive income. Why don't we get aggressive? And uh, let's go for an oil and gas uh, wildcat program. If we do lose money, at least whatever we do lose, we can use to offset that passive income. So what we might want to do is recommend an oil and gas wildcat program, exploratory. Now be careful, I didn't say we should try and lose money. That's not what I said. What I said was, is that we have a large amount of passive income, we might want to consider getting aggressive and uh, recommending an oil and gas wildcat exploratory program. So, you know, how that test phraseology, a customer and investor has a large amount of passive income, which direct participation program might be suitable. And what they're testing on is the idea of matching these things up. I had a, uh, at our little subreddit community, oh my goodness, people are getting carried away. You know, I, I like to put uh, posts there, you know, practice questions based on current events. I haven't had to make a new role as moderator that you know, not anybody can, can post these these practice questions to the community. However, uh, good news. I mean, you know, I, it's, you know, I want people to have fun, but he had uh, posted a question based on this suitability and he had a customer who had a large amount of passive uh, activity losses. And then he was asking the participants to come up with the, the passive income. Now, the only thing I kind of corrected with him is his, uh, he said leasing. And I said, well, no, you know, leasing has already got depreciated cash flow it would be, you know, all cash real estate or something like that. I don't think you you know need to worry about that on the test, but you know, uh, I'd clean up. And then talk about haters. I had another subreddit guy who, you know, we have a little civil war going on between subreddits. And he said, oh, you know, that that was a convoluted kind of question. I'm like, yeah, he, listen, based on the answer set, you could figure out the answer, and that's why I left it up. You know. Anyways, okay, so let's see. I think that's it. I don't know what else I got here. Yeah. Um, let me just uh, go back here. There we go. So we talked about in today's lecture, we talked about uh, taxation. Uh, this is the fulfillment of a uh, lecture request from one of our uh, YouTube channel subscribers. And so if you have a request, put it in. I don't make it, I'm not trying to keep up with people's test dates. It's just too difficult on the request of listeners, lectures. I tried to do that. Um, in the channel update, I told you we're gonna do 65, 66, uh, explicated practice exam. That's done for all intents and purposes, but I'm going to be teaching a series of 65, 66 classes. I'm getting some more debriefs. So I plan on publishing it after I get through that sequence because I think it will add some value to what I end up publishing. So that's still pending, uh, but this has now been fulfilled. And this guy is loyal enough that I think he's testing the 12th that I wanted to make sure I did get it to him before he, he tested. So I hope he finds it helpful. I hope you find it helpful. 
uh, like, comment, subscribe, do all that social media stuff. Uh, the channel itself is uh, now at 5,306 views. Our top lecture is options. That's at 715 views. And so uh, I appreciate your uh, support.